Uh, I'm Marty Kaplan. I'm the director of the Norman Lear Center. Uh, Hollywood Health and Society is a, a program of the Lear Center. Uh, you'll hear a lot about it tonight, uh, but uh, just to put in a plug for the umbrella under which it comes, uh, the Lear Center st uh, studies and shapes the impact of media and entertainment on society. And if the idea of doing that interests you, or the idea of a place named after Norman Lear interests you, I welcome you to our website, which is learcenter.org. Um, we're very glad you came here tonight. We're grateful that our panel could be here tonight. And uh, I'm going to introduce to you the director of our Hollywood Health and Society program, who will be our Sherpa for the evening, uh, Sandra DeCastro Buffington. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. And welcome, everyone. It's so good to see you tonight. I'd like to start by giving a special welcome to Hollywood Health and Society's donors. Um, they make it possible for us to serve as a free resource to the creative community um, to provide medical experts and expertise for your scripts. So we'd like to start with uh, thanking Mary Ganikos, who's here from the Health Services and Resources and Services Administration's Department of Transplantation. Mary has been a long-standing partner and guiding force, and we thank you. I'd also like to recognize our board members. Hollywood Health and Society's board, we have with us Tracy Blackwell, Diana Bonta, Mary Ganikos, Donna Cantor, Alisa Lifshitz, Doe Mayer, Robert Montgomery, you know, he was one of our guests tonight, um, and Michael Taylor, uh, Socorro Serrano, um, and James Redfield. Thank you. Redford, thank you. <laughs> Thanks also to the Lear Center and Hollywood Health and Society staff who have organized this wonderful program for us tonight. So Hollywood Health and Society provides television and film writers with a free service to help them get accurate medical information from experts for their scripts. For nearly a decade, Hollywood Health and Society has served as a credible source of public health information while understanding the dramatic needs of Hollywood's master storytellers. And speaking of drama, there is no health topic as dramatic and compelling as organ transplantation. No other health topic is riddled with ethical and moral dilemmas, controversy, emotion, ticking clocks, tragic endings, and happily ever afters. It's no wonder that TV shows and films are increasingly portraying organ transplantation in their storylines. Tonight, we have an extraordinary panel who will speak to you about the many facets of organ transplantation. You'll hear from a world expert on transplantation from my alma mater, the Johns Hopkins University, and an organ transplant recipient whose nonprofit organization is dedicated to educating the public about the need for organ and tissue donation through film and the web. And we also have an established television writer and producer who will talk about creating and writing powerful, award-winning shows about organ transplantation. Also on the panel is a well-known expert from Cedar sinai who will expose the common myths of transplantation. And finally, uh, not finally, uh, we'll also hear some compelling personal stories from a husband and father who made the important decision to donate his family member's organs, and from a mother who stepped up to the plate when her daughter needed a kidney. And finally, we have the CEO of the largest organ recovery agency in the world. To speak with us tonight about innovative new approaches in the field of organ transplantation, I'm delighted to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Robert Montgomery. Dr. Montgomery is an associate professor of surgery director of the Incompatible Kidney Transplant Program, chief of the Division of Transplantation and director of the Comprehensive Transplant Center at the Johns Hopkins University and Hospital. Dr. Montgomery, considered a world's expert on kidney transplantation of complex patients and patients with incompatible donors, was part of the team that developed the laparoscopic procedure for live kidney donation, a procedure which has become the standard throughout the world. He also led the team that performed the first triple swap, the triple domino swap, and the world's first quintuple kidney pair donation. 
We very much look forward to hearing his presentation, so please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Robert Montgomery. Thank you, Sandra. That was very nice. And um, good evening. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm in the category tonight of uh, best short presentation. <laughs> um, I thought I would uh, start out with um, a, a story. Um, uh, Dr. Klein, one of Dr. Klein's uh, uh, co-workers at uh, Cedar, uh, Cedar Sinai, is Don Defoe, who has a very famous brother, um, Willem Defoe. And Don, one night we were out to dinner, and uh, he was talking about his brother. And he was uh, talking about how self-absorbed um, actors are. And uh, he mentioned uh, that his brother had just uh, finished doing um, a film with Robert Redford. And, um, his, and Willem was saying, you know, did you, did you know that, uh, that Robert Redford's son had received a, a liver transplant and uh and and don said to him well did you you know did you tell robert redford that your brother is um a liver transplant surgeon and willem defoe uh said uh it, it never really occurred to me <laughs> <laughs> so i wanted to uh <laughs> start out by just showing you um uh, a couple of uh, film clips. It's The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. Well, here's an amazing story I mentioned the other night. Uh, doctors in Baltimore performed an operation where they removed a woman's kidney through her vagina. Now, doesn't that sound like some kind of bad bar bet made by a couple of surgeons after a few beers, you know? I bet you I can take out a guy's prostate through his navel. Oh, yeah? Well, I'm gonna take out her kidney through her vagina. You're on! You know, it didn't seem like some bad... <laughs> uh, anyway. Weekend Update with Seth Meyers. Doctors in Maryland are hoping that an operation they performed in which they removed a donor's kidney through her vagina will encourage others to donate as well. Though I fail to see how we'll pull it out through your vagina sweetens the deal. Well, now there's some material. <laughs> we did, in fact, um, a year ago, uh, remove uh, a kidney through uh, a woman's vagina. And we at, at Hopkins um, have really been very focused on expanding live donation and one of the things that we've tried to do is to make it um, uh, as easy as possible to donate a kidney um, and so we initially uh, developed a minimally invasive way of removing um, a kidney we the operation used to be um, a large incision open procedure and frequently the recipient of the kidney would leave the hospital before the donor. Um, so using the new technology of um, inserting uh, uh, small cameras into the abdomen and uh, uh, the new instrumentation that allowed one to perform an operation through very tiny incisions, um, we started to remove uh, kidneys for donation um, through uh, that technique. And this is sort of the um, logical, uh, I guess, extension of um, that sort of technology. There's an area in, um, in surgery now called note surgery. And the idea of note surgery is that you use natural, uh, natural orifice to do surgery. So, um, for instance, uh, gallbladders have uh, been removed um, by putting fiber optic uh, scopes through uh, the stomach, through a person's mouth, down into their stomach, an incision made in the stomach, and then the gallbladder removed that way. So it occurred to me one time when I was um, reading an article about that uh, new frontier of surgery that why not, why couldn't we uh, uh, use a natural orifice um, to uh, remove a, a kidney? Um, and uh, the, the woman, the first patient in the world that uh, 
donated a kidney to um, her niece um, through uh, a vaginal extraction, um, went home the next day, um, didn't receive any pain medication after the operation, and said that her pain was just like a bad menstrual cramp. So um, what I thought I'd do is just mention um, what I think are some of the interesting new frontiers in uh, transplantation uh, that, that might be fodder for um, uh, stories. I think that um, when we begin to uh, answer questions as a panel, we can get into um, a lot of uh, uh, the mythology and a lot of the human interest stories and that sort of thing. Um, but anyway, I, I was just going to outline a few things like this that um, might not be obvious to everyone. One of the things that we have been working on, which actually was um, uh, turned into um, a segment of uh, Gray's Anatomy uh, called uh, There's No I in Team, is the, um, these multiple swaps. So uh, a large percentage of patients who have a, a living, um, willing donor are unable to receive a kidney from that donor because they're incompatible either by blood or tissue. And um, kidney pair donation or, or swaps are, are a way around that. So essentially what happens is a, a, a person's donor um, gives their kidney to a stranger so that their loved one can uh, receive a compatible organ. And um, I think that uh, that is uh, a very interesting um, new development in transplantation that's ripe um, for uh, uh, the humanness of those kinds of decisions and, um, and meeting a stranger who uh, has uh, donated an organ. Uh, that used to only occur in uh, deceased donation where occasionally people would be able to meet the family of the person uh, who had died and donated an organ, but in live donation traditionally the, the donor has always been known and has been a family member usually or a loved one. So this opens a whole new, uh, I think, uh, area of, um, uh, of uh, relationships and, and what happens, you know, frequently people do want to meet each other after the transplant and, and we do allow that. Then there's this group of, um, there's about 100 people every year in the United States who come forward and say, I want to donate my kidney to anyone who needs it. And we, we call those altruistic donors, although all donors are altruistic, um, or non-directed donors. And um, what we've been doing um, with those donors is, is we have um, uh, tried to help them to more fully realize their altruism by starting a whole domino of transplants. Again, um, the idea of, uh, of finding a compatible organ for somebody who has a willing um, uh, live donor who's incompatible. And these altruistic donors can set off, um, uh, you know, six, seven, um, eight transplants and be responsible f for their gift uh, for all those transplants. And um, those people are fascinating. And a few of uh, um, my patients um, were the subject of a really nice article, a uh, New Yorker article, about what motivates these people to do this. And I think that's a really interesting uh, potential story because um, these people are unlike anyone you can imagine. And, the, and but the, the reasons, the, the motivations are quite varied. There was one, one of my patients um, uh, had uh, uh, lost um, uh, her son um, at age six. He, he, one of the neighbors had, had uh, backed up over the child, uh, a very horrible, tragic uh, accident. And uh, the child died instantly, and they were unable to donate the organs. And so this was, she, she did this in, in his honor. Um, and there, there was another patient who 
uh, his wife died from ALS and he was powerless to try to help her uh, during the, this process um, and so wanted to give um, an organ because uh, it was something he'd have control over. Um, I think that uh, another very interesting uh, new development um, in transplantation is that we now have um, two types of uh, deceased donors. So they're, they're the traditional donor who's brain dead, and in our society we, we um, define death as uh, the cessation of brain function. So these individuals' hearts are still beating, they're, they're still on life support, but they're, they're brain dead. And that's sort of the traditional donor. But in, in recent years, um, we, have began, we have begun to uh, utilize uh, um, organs from another type of donor uh, called a donor after cardiac death. Um, and this has been somewhat controversial. And um, usually what happens is someone is neurologically devastated and has no chance of recovery, but is not, doesn't fulfill strictly the criteria of brain death. And so the family decides that they want to withdraw support and the tube's taken out and the person's heart stops. And then the, the team um, that's standing by, um, obviously the family has decided that they want to uh, donate the organs, uh, waits until um, a, a, a doctor on this, uh, who has been taking care of the patient declares the patient dead, and then the, the uh, patient is taken into the operating room and their organs are removed. And there's also something, um, another category called um, uncontrolled uh, donors after cardiac death, and these are, uh, you know, victims of crime in the city, someone comes into uh, the emergency room, uh, they've been shot several times and, and lost all their blood. Um, and uh, there's a lot of controversy about whether these individuals should be, um, uh, uh, you know, begun the, the process of removing um, their organs or uh, preserving their organs um, should uh, occur right there in the emergency room. Um, and that's a very, I think, interesting, uh, it, it's being done in, in other countries, and uh, we're sort of testing the water to see what sort of the public response might be um, to that concept. So these are all very interesting uh, areas. I think there's a lot of um, debate now in transplantation about um, paying for donors, and there are certain countries um, that have uh, national schemes um, where they uh, uh, where it's legal um, for a donor to receive um, money um, for donating a, an organ, um, and this is very hotly uh, debated right now in, uh, in our field. The idea of of either paying um, for the uh, the donor or um, uh, at least um, minimizing uh, the expenses that the donor might um, uh, experience during the donation process. Sometimes people have to travel great distances. Um, the hotel, the, the travel expenses aren't reimbursed. So there's sort of a spectrum of ideas and feelings about how far to go with um, helping uh, donors uh, to realize um, their gift, uh, and, and certainly uh, there are people within our field that uh, strongly advocate for um, uh, paying for uh, organs as a way to solve this terrible crisis that we're in the midst of. Um, there are about 80,000 people waiting for a kidney transplant. Last year we did about 16,000 kidney transplants, about 7,000 people died waiting. So those numbers are very uh, uh, sobering. Um, and, and obviously a lot of what we do um, is uh, directed at trying to figure out ways to um, increase the number of organs that um, are available. Um, and then uh, certainly an area that uh, is um, off in the future somewhere 
is the idea of uh, using um, stem cells or cells that can be uh, coaxed into being um, uh, any cells in the body um, because they haven't differentiated yet. And the idea that perhaps someday we could grow an organ um, in a laboratory. Um, and I think that is a, a, a very interesting uh, development uh, that I don't expect um, to see results in, in my lifetime, but um, there are great strides being made in, in the science of, uh, of uh, stem cell therapy. Um, so I think I'll, uh, I'll stop there, and I think probably the, the greatest use that we can provide um, is by answering questions that, that you all have about transplantation, what's real and what's not, and, um, and you know, what's interesting and, uh, and new. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Montgomery, for sharing your insights with us. Um, next, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Um, first, we have Dr. Neil Baer. Neil is a Harvard-trained physician, a pediatrician, and a former executive producer of the Emmy Award-winning series, ER. He's currently executive producer of Law & Order SVU, and he happens to be the co-chair of the Hollywood Health and Society Board. And he makes tremendous contributions to us, to the health of his viewers in the United States and around the world, and to the health of developing countries. Thank you, Neil. We're also joined by Dr. Joe Sachs, a consulting producer on the NBC dramatic series, Mercy. He served many years as a writer and executive producer of the award-winning series, ER, um, writing 36 episodes of the medical drama, including the teleplay for Exodus, nominated by the Writers Guild of America as the outstanding television script of 1998. Hollywood Health and Society recently awarded ER with two Sentinel for Health awards for an episode on organ transplantation for a major storyline and a minor storyline, and Joe graciously accepted the, on the show's behalf. Then we have Jamie Redford, president of the James Redford Institute for Transplant Awareness and co-producer of Share the Beat. Jamie, who received a liver transplant in 1995, is also the producer of The Kindness of Strangers, an award-winning HBO documentary film, and Flow, a short drama targeted to high schools and community-based youth programs. Tonight, we also welcome a renowned transplant surgeon, Dr. Andrew Klein. Dr. Klein is the director of the Cedars-Sinai Comprehensive Transplant Center, where he provides oversight and programmatic direction for the institution's liver, kidney, pancreas, heart, and lung transplant programs. Dr. Klein is also a professor of surgery at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA, and I see that we're out of order, and I apologize for that. <laughs> um, our next two panelists have extraordinary and compelling personal stories to share. Dr. Kenneth Mortsugu is the chairman of the Johnson & Johnson Diabetes Institute. Prior to his current position, Dr. Muritsugu was the acting Surgeon General of the United States, serving as the nation's top doctor and communicating the best available science and information to the American people. For 15 years, he was a board member of the Washington Regional Transplant Community, the organ procurement organization serving the metropolitan Washington, D.C. area. His personal story of the tragic loss of two family members is powerful and inspirational and we look forward to hearing from him. I'm also very pleased to welcome Melody Williams. Melody says that at an early age, she was taught the value of helping others, especially family and those less fortunate. That life lesson served her well when her daughter, Crystal, needed a kidney transplant. Tonight, Melody will share her true story about the gift of life. And last but not least, I'd like to introduce um, Chief Executive Officer and Executive Vice President of One Legacy, Mr. Thomas Mohn. Mr. Mohn um, 
leads the U.S.'s largest organ recovery agency, serving 19 million people. One Legacy annually recovers 400 or organ donors and 1,300 organs for transplant. Tom le has led the development of the first industry standard of a web-based organ uh, placement, and we look forward to hearing from you tonight as well. So now, uh, let's welcome our panelists, and I'll turn it over to Neil. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we'll begin with Joe Sachs, and it's really my pleasure to start with Joe because I worked with Joe. Joe started on ER in 1994 when I did, the very first year, and he stayed the whole time until last year, uh, which is a, an accomplishment in and of itself. And Joe really did do you know, the medicine on the show and uh, was very um, much responsible for the accuracy of uh, the, the medicine on the show as well. You know, and if you ever want to learn how to suture, just ask Joe, because he taught Noah Wiley and Eric LaSalle using <laughs> chicken parts, right? <laughs> chicken? Did you use chicken? I remember. So um, anyway, we're going to start with Joe. And um, first, we're going to show some clips from ER. And then Joe will speak briefly about them. Then I'll ask him a few questions, or probably one question, because you probably have questions tonight. And then we'll, we'll move on to each panel member. So save your questions until the end, and then we'll, we'll uh, ask for them. So, can we uh, start with... No brain stem evoked responses. I guess after 10 minutes. PCO2 is 74. 74? Anything over 60 means brain death. I'm so sorry, Chas. What are you doing? Chaz, there, there are no vital signs to monitor. Uh, not yet. Can you please just keep this thing going a couple more hours? No, no, he, he could come back. Maybe he'll come back. His heart's gone. His brain's gone. We're pronouncing him. Still warm. Yeah, it's just the bypass machine. We need to keep him on it to perfuse the organs. Neil is going to take him to the OR now. I got this from Minos, you know, a 15 year old. Girl in Nebraska, father of three in Maryland, and a college student in Texas all got organs from Greg. He saved three lives that day. What was Billy like? He's wonderful. Smart, funny, handsome. He loves music, especially the kind that I can't stand, and he plays it really loud. Yeah. Uh, lots of friends. There's always kids coming in and out of the house. Big heart. He really cares about people. Even the little kids, I mean, that's really unusual, you know? Sounds like a great kid. Yeah. Generous?
parts do they use? Pancreas, kidneys, liver, lungs, corneas to help the blind see again, bones, tendons, cartilage, ligaments to help people walk. You can change lives for the better. Five lives, maybe ten, maybe dozens. Billy's heart could possibly save someone else's life before dark. It's not going to make up for what you lost, but... It is something. Thank you, um, it's, uh, and, and thank you, Hollywood Health and Society, for inviting me um, to, this, uh, to this panel. Um, I, I, I figured I should start with a, a story about an interaction with a uh, transplant recipient, and it, it, it just dawned on me that in, in 2001, um, I went scuba diving at possibly the most remote place that you can go in Fiji. So we flew to a little island in Fiji and then took a, my wife and I took a uh, single prop plane to another tiny island and then it was about an hour and a half to get to this dive site in the middle of nowhere. And um, as a doctor, I always travel with a medical kit just so I'll have everything that I could possibly need uh, to handle emergencies. And uh, we got there and who should be there diving with us but David Crosby who um, is a liver transplant recipient. And as you know, it's very important for transplant recipients to stay close to hospitals because they're on powerful immune, immunosuppressive drugs. And if you get sick, you want to be right in your hospital. So I'm going, what an idiot. He's scuba diving. I mean, it would, be, it would be 12 hours to the nearest hospital. And I'm going, oh, boy, something's going to happen this week. I just have this feeling. So sure enough, um, about three days into the trip, my wife got violently ill with a stomach virus. And the compazine that I had didn't do anything to help her. But David had this new drug, Zofran, that uh, saved her. She was better the next day, and uh, he ended up helping me. So, uh, so it all worked out. Thank you, David. Um, I, I want to uh, talk about how we create stories, because I'm here as a writer. And, and how we create net medical stories is that we never, ever start um, with the medicine. Um, which may come as a surprise. Um, we always start with the dramatic needs of the character. These, these, these um, programs are not about the medicine. If they were just about the medicine, people would be watching the Discovery Channel or the Learning Channel. Uh, so it, there have to be great dramatic uh, situations. So I, I thought I'd just talk about how those two stories were created that you, that you saw. Um, so first was the death of um, Greg Pratt, Mackay Pfeiffer's character. And um, it, uh, you know, this was my burden. H how are you going to kill off a TV character in a new way? And, you know, the old way is that you're doing CPR and they're pumping on his chest and someone says, okay, we're going to call it. And they look up at the clock and they go, time of death, 8.15, everybody's sad. So we thought a, a kind of a, a very emotional and new way to do it. He, he was a victim of a blast injury. He had an air embolus that went to his brain. So he was brain dead. And his brother, who was the paramedic, had to come to terms with accepting that he was brain dead and was going to be an organ donor. So it was a very interesting, compelling, emotional story for the, for the, the brother and also for the whole department because as he wheeled to the elevator to take him to surgery, it was a funeral procession where all of his friends and colleagues and loved ones watched him pass one last time. So it was great drama, but as a side effect, people learned about brain death, they learned about the apnea test, they learned about the EEG that was used, and, and it, what it comes to, to come to terms for a family member with, with, uh, with donation. So it kind of was a great story, and, it, and people learned from it. So that's great. And then the Clooney clip uh, was supposed to be the season finale of ER, 
Um, and it wasn't because at the last minute NBC said, we want four more. So it ended up being like the fourth from the last one and we had all these intricate stories laid out. Uh, so we had to kind of put it earlier in the year. But the challenge to that one was how do you connect a character, a loved character who hasn't been on the show in 10 years? He's in Seattle. So I figured, okay, he's a pediatrician in Seattle. We're going to make his wife, Carol Hathaway, uh, a transplant coordinator. Two doctors from our hospital go, and, uh, and they, um, and they uh, are delayed because he has to convince the grandmother, in this case, to, uh, to consent to um, organ donation. And uh, in the very dramatic scene, you saw the, the tenderness, you saw the compassion, you saw the way in which... Uh, consent was obtained. We also had some other technical details with cerebral blood flow. That um, that's a very real way to 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 to, to prove uh, brain death. And uh, and the final twist, of course, was that because of the delay, they had an extra kidney that they sent back to some doctor who needed a transplant in Chicago. And they ended up saving Noah Wiley's um, character, uh, uh, John Carter's life, who needed a uh, a kidney transplant. So we start with drama. We add the medicine that fits, and uh, my thanks really go out to Hollywood Health and Society and to organizations such as Donate Life, who have helped us so much with these stories. We always look for expert guidance. Expert guidance gives you great detail um, that makes your stories real, different, and uh, you can tell great stories, but as a side effect, um, people learn and, uh, and are educated. What's the – so the question I have for you, Joe, is um, – because you, you did a lot of transplantation stories over the 15 years of ER. What was the impact of those stories? Can you give us some examples of how stories made a difference? Um, specifically, I don't think I can specifically speak to that, but we know that from, from uh, surveys of, of regular viewers of ER that, um, you know, about over close to 60% learned important things, said they learned new things about medicine and health from the show, and 33% actually learned something that helped them or a family member. So that impact is huge when you think that in the, you know, the early seasons of ER, 40 million people were watching the show um, every week. So it pays to be accurate then. Yes, it does. <laughs> we always agreed about that, even though he's a emergency physician and I'm a pediatrician. We did agree that accuracy was really important because so many people saw right there those two, just those two clips, the millions of people and people still see them over and over. So if you're putting out stories, you, especially about uh, things that are fairly, that have some controversy involving them, um, I think that's fair to say that we think that that's important. Yeah, in fact, I just, um, I just axed a story on Mercy <laughs> that was very close to happening because it was inaccurate in checking with transplant uh, authorities. It was about a, um, a, living, uh, a liver, the, the so-called living donor split liver. Maybe some of you have heard of this, that a, a living donor can donate a lobe of their liver, which regenerates both in the donor and the recipient. Um, and uh, it was a situation where the living donor was going to be uh, a sister who um, had a terrible injury and was in a coma. Uh, and you can't do that. You, to be a living donor, you have to be 100% healthy. And that is an important message to get out there. And I did not want an inaccurate story. So we had to change and, re and modify the story that they'd created. Good. I'm glad you did. Yeah. Um, now, we'll, we'll, thanks, Joe. And uh, we'll move on to Jamie Redford. I met Jamie, actually, during the first year of ER and uh, was able to learn about his uh, multiple transplantations, right, Jamie? Um, and uh, really, by knowing someone, that's also a, a real help to a writer where you get to hear his or her story. And I, that's always where we started on ER2, and, and, and certainly what we do now is in interviewing people to really get the nuances of their stories. Um, so, Jamie, please. Uh, tell us about your organization, what your, what your uh, passion is about uh, getting the word out and sharing the beat. Well, it's obviously personal. Um, having been uh, diagnosed in the late 80s with an end-stage liver disease and 
told I had five years, which ended up being exactly right. Um, a slow slide into uh, pretty bad shape. And um, transplant for me was, was sort of unique in that in the first operation didn't work. Uh, there were problems with the artery blood flow and it killed off part of the donated organ. And I was in limbo for about four months because they weren't, they couldn't technically declare me, and this is getting a little bit into the interest keys of things that can be interesting that aren't necessarily headline news. Um, they said, well, we're, if you ask me off the record, I don't think this liver is gonna make it, but right now, your numbers are good enough that we have to formally release you from the hospital um, but we don't anticipate that you're going to make it in the long run, but because the, the list is complicated <laughs> and there's people waiting, we have a criteria for what's considered a healthy transplant, um, you're going to have to uh, move it on out and stay here in Omaha for a while and we'll just have to see how you do. And that was a really fun time, I tell you, living in the Homewood Suites, eating English muffins, wondering what, what's going to happen. Um, but uh, inevitably, they were, their hunches were correct, and I went downhill, and then I was retransplanted, and everything's been terrific since then. So, but what I came out um, uh, and re-entered into the world, um, I, I would come across occasional things, um, whether it was news reports or television uh, shows, not all of them as thoughtful as you are, certainly not. Um, and I thought, well, this is a shame. This looks nothing like my experience. And boy, there's there's a there's a the big thing missing here is the donor family. Um, in, in the early mid '90s, there was just no exploration of the miracle of the gift going on, as far as I was concerned. Um, and at the same time, I was encouraged to sort of uh, there there was a lot of criticism within the medical establishment about um, what was happening on television in those days. Um, I was encouraged to speak out, but you see, um, I've written some movies, directed a movie, produced some docs, and so I, 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 in my other day job, night job, whatever it is, I'm doing what you guys are doing, and it felt wrong to take on sort of a, the attitude of sort of being a censor or coming out and saying, don't do this, or you can, you know, I, I, I made a decision at that point, um, to just tell the right story from what my own direct experience was, so then I did the documentary. Um, and then after, and the documentary was um, a wonderful thing. It reached a lot of people on HBO, as you can imagine. Um, I had the, so well, you know, it's a mixed, it's always bittersweet with transplant, because you're, you're, you're intertwining life and death. It's always bittersweet. And, um, I got, a, I got a, a phone call from one of the OPOs we had worked with in our documentary, um, the OP Organ Procurement Organization handles the delivery of the organs and procurement, um, who we had worked with on the HBO doc, who just wanted me to know that they had just, um, they had just ha done a harvesting, which is my least favorite word. If you can do one thing, get rid of the word harvest because it's, it's, it doesn't make any sense. But they had um, talked to a family. They'd gone in to talk to a family just like this conversation here. And the OPO worker went in to have the discussion. And the husband, it was a, it was a child, and the, the mother and father said, oh, no, 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 no. Well, we saw this. We just were talking about this. We just saw this documentary last week. And, you know, we had decided we wanted to do this, so just do it. And um, so in this case, um, the, the movie, I don't know specifically, but it was uh, life-saving uh, specifically to some amount of people, I'm sure. But most of the time, you don't have those kinds of, you don't know. You don't really know. Um, and I did it with the belief that you could, if you kept telling stories, uh, it would reach people. So... I've now focused on trying to reach kids with Annie Aft, who runs the foundation. She's a dynamo, and she would love to talk to any of you if you wanted to reach her through the website. She's an enormously knowledgeable. <coughs> and um, we're doing outreach to kids, because the other thing I believe is that if you actually have to tell this, like, I, I defy any of you that really, if you go in deep in your research on this topic, um, 
I think you'll I I can't speak for you obviously, but I have a feeling you'll dis, you'll you'll have a favorable notion of the whole world of it in general. And kids do that too if you teach with them. So that's what we're doing now. We're working with the kids. Thanks, Jamie. Can you just speak a little uh, a bit more specifically about how you work with kids because as writers we do write for children as well and this is a topic that some people feel may be too adult or too dark or too too difficult. And so how have you addressed those issues? How can one write for kids and how do you and what are some of the briefly the projects that you all are doing or uh, uh, that can inspire some of the writers here? Um there's a project called Redford Animation Project. It's being run by Annie Apt, who's not here tonight. Uh, she goes around to uh, schools and holds animation workshops. And so it's sort of a, a dual thing. It's storytelling, animation, and uh, that's what the kids get from us. They, they learn how to tell a short story in 30 seconds. Um, and they also learn how to animate uh, traditionally. And in return, um, they have to deal with the top. It has to be a PSA for organ donation. So we're giving them some skills, um, and but I think our nasty little agenda is that we we think that if kids have to actually inhabit the storytelling role and tell the story, um, it'll be a far deeper uh, awareness for them of what organ donation is. So really getting them, so the key is getting them to, to be able to tell the story, understand the story, I, you expose them to stories so that they have a, a deeper understanding that's not such a mystery. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Dr. Kenneth Mortsugu has a, a personal story that he's going to share with us now. I'd like you to imagine the following scenario. You're driving back home from a day, sightseeing with visiting relatives, when your pager goes off. You call your office and your assistant informs you that there has been a terrible automobile accident involving your wife. You immediately head to the hospital. The nurse ombudsman meets you as soon as you walk in to the emergency room and identify yourself to the clerk. She escorts you to a small, quiet, private room off to the side. She informs you that your wife has been severely injured. She offers you coffee, access to a phone, and invites you to remain in the room, assuring you that she will help keep you informed. She returns periodically to advise you of what's happening. It's not good. A trauma surgeon stops in. The team has stabilized vital functions, but there has been severe head trauma. The neurosurgeon is with your wife. A chaplain arrives unsummoned and offers comfort. The neurosurgeon enters and describes what has happened. Your wife has sustained such severe head trauma that while her heart is still beating, she's lost blood flow to the brain. She's dead. The doctor remains to answer questions and then leaves you to your grief with your family who has now gathered. Shortly after, the nurse ombudsman returns again and escorts you to the trauma room to see your wife who has been cleaned from her injuries. It's a tragic moment. Later, as you're leaving her side, the neurosurgeon joins you, walks down the corridor with you, and gently raises the question of what would you like to do. His question jogs your memory of an earlier discussion years before between you and your wife. You each had decided to be organ donors on your deaths and had discussed this with each other. What would you do now? This scenario is not the script. This scenario is real life. It happened to me and to my family nearly 18 years ago. 18 years ago, my wife, Donna Lee, died in an automobile accident. And because of her generosity, a man in Tampa, Florida, received her heart in a new lease on life for seven years. A teenage boy in Washington, D.C., failing in school because of his disease, received a kidney and a pancreas. A hospital custodian received her other, uh, her other kidney. A woman in Pennsylvania received her liver. A retarded young woman in Baltimore, Maryland, received one cornea, and a government worker received the other. 
But that's not the end of the story. Because four years later, my daughter, Vicki Leanne, died in a separate automobile accident. And again, because of the professionalism and the caring of so many individuals, a mother of five children from upstate New York received a heart and a new lease on life for herself and for her family. A widow with four children received her lung. A 59-year-old man from Washington, D.C., active with a local charity, received her liver. A widower with one daughter received one kidney. A married working father of several children received the other kidney. A 26-year-old man in Florida received one cornea, and a 60-year-old woman in Pennsylvania received the other. This is a human story with human impact. It's about individuals giving to other individuals, families reaching out, often during periods of tragedy and grief, to help other families, professionals, physicians, nurses, physician assistants, administrators, mobilizing to secure this marvelous gift of life, mobilizing to recover and to transplant this life-saving, this life-enhancing gift. And while we were making the decision to donate, in each instance, professional staff from the local organ procurement organization were there to help us in a caring and respectful manner to make these gifts of life happen. When Donna died in 1992, 18 years ago, there were about 30,000 people on the waiting list for a solid organ, and she helped remove four people from that list into a renewed life. When Vicky died four years later, 50,000 occupied the waiting list, and she helped remove five people from that list. But today, there are in excess of 106,000 people waiting. That's enough to fill the new LA Stadium, which will hold up to 80,000 spectators to overflowing, with 26,000 more people waiting to get in. Organ procurement organizations are a key element in this human system that helps people help others through their generosity. It's their responsibility to approach families and next of kin, to ask for organ and tissue donation, and to assure that every organ and tissue is transplanted effectively to benefit people. And over the years, their roles and responsibilities have continued to grow, to increase awareness, to educate professionals in the community, to support families in time of grief and tragedy, to help next of kin to consider donating their loved ones' organs and tissues, to mobilize the resources and the organizations to recover organs and tissues, to place them where they will do the most good in concert with the National Organ Matching Program and to assure that this legacy of life will go on. And today, nearly two decades after my family lost a wife, a mother, a daughter, a sister, an aunt, a friend, and nearly 15 years after my family lost a daughter, a sister, a niece, we still take comfort in the realization that while we could not have prevented their deaths, we have facilitated their legacies, their life-giving gifts to humanity, to people, as do all donors, from their gifts of hearts and kidneys and livers and lungs and pancreas, corneas and other organs and tissues. These donors save lives, improve the quality of lives, as I have shown by the impact the two people in my family have had on so many others. Organ donation and transplantation is not the result of any one person, but rather that of a finely coordinated team of people. It's the gift of hope. It's truly a legacy of life. Thank you for sharing that deeply personal story with us. Uh, the audience was wrapped, and you can see still that they're, they're quite affected by the story that you told. And 
there were so many elements in the story that one could certainly draw on and craft into, into a story that could be powerful dramatically. Um, if I came to you as a writer and said I was doing a show, I wanted to do an episode about organ donation, what's the one thing you would tell me to get right? What would you say, you've got to get this right? Um, I really, you know, this is what, you know, I just am passionate about. What would you tell me? What I'd say <clears throat> is that transplantation is the gift of life, but no transplantation can occur without a donation. And donors and donor families are humans. And the message that really needs to get across to everyone is that donor families want to help. They also want to be treated with respect. And if that message can get across, that I think will help. Thank you. We're going to move on to Dr. Andrew Klein, who's the director of the Cedar sinai Comprehensive Transplant Center. Uh, thank you. Um, I was really happy to see Ken when I walked in tonight because our paths have crossed uh, previously, but then I realized I had to speak after he did. And after you've heard his beautiful and compelling story, you can understand this has happened twice before to me, uh, <laughs> that it doesn't get any easier <laughs> after every time. But I thought instead of giving you my opinions about um, sort of the perceptions of organ donation and transplantation, I actually would want to hear yours. And so I've posed some questions that are going to be based upon some popular mythology about uh, organ donation and transplantation. And we're going to gauge it. We're going to benchmark it to one of the polls that's been taken, this one by Donate Life America in 2009. And what I'd ask you to do is um, please respond the way you really believe, not the way you think is is correct politically or that is the right answer because I think the better we understand what the perception is of a group like this, I think we can probably make some significant uh, gains. So the first question is, um, doctors may not try as hard to save my life if they know I wish to be an organ donor or a tissue donor. True or false? All, the, all those who say true, please ra ra raise your hand. See, there are some honest people there. Well, 51% um, of the population that voted on this said they thought this was true or they didn't know. So half the people actually believe um, that, that you do actually, if you agree to be an organ donor, it's on your donor card, that for some reason they're going to treat you differently. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Hold, yeah. Your, hold your questions till. Okay. Uh, second question, organ or tissue donation is against my religion, true or false? If it's true, please ra raise your hand. One person, two people, okay. Um, only 28% um, either agree with that or did not know. Uh, this is a good one. In the U.S., people with money and power have a better chance of receiving donated organs than other people. True? Uh, now we have some honesty here. Okay, 85% um, of the people either agreed or didn't know that if you are, have money or power, you have better access, uh, or not better access, you have a better chance of receiving a donated organ. Now, this was alluded to the next question in the, um, in the piece that was shown from ER. Um, it is possible for a brain-dead person to recover from his or her in injuries. It may... True. Anyone say, say true? True? Okay. Um, this was actually featured, I won't uh, embarrass the, um, the show, but it was a very popular drama where um, a woman comes out of the um, intensive care room. She's just seen her, um, her husband, and she says, well, um, he was brain dead, but now they thought he's going to recover. So when you hear that, it just makes you think, you know, it loses the credibility we have in the transplant community to, uh, to um, reassure people that, if you're brain dead, it's not like sort of dead or almost dead or nearly, nearly dead. Um, it really means Under that you've Congress. died. <laughs> Pardon? We stand under Congress. <laughs> <laughs> All right. In the U.S., there's a black market for which people can buy or sell organs. True? Um, 
85% of the people that actually took this poll said true or they did not know. And the final question I have, um, this actually isn't a question, I'll just give you the answer straight out. So it says, in general, have the TV shows or movies you've seen about organ or tissue donation made you more interested or less interested in becoming an organ or tissue donor? So 79% said they hadn't seen anything or it had, or it had no effect. 16% said it became, they became more interested in donating. And 4% said they became less interested in, in donating. So uh, I think that the truth is the better we can, we can address this mythology, this is really a, for you, the better you can address this mythology and eliminate some of the disincentives for um, organ donation. I think this can be a very powerful message and um, a very positive impact on organ transplantation. So Thank I'll stop you. there. So I have two questions. You get two questions. Oh, boy. <laughs> Since you asked us questions. My first question is about childhood obesity. And um, do you see uh, there's a huge increase in type 2 diabetes, and that obviously affects kidney, not obviously, but it affects kidneys and may cause the need for transplantation at some point. Do you see an increasing need for transplantation in the future? Well, actually, I'll answer it sort of reverse. The problem with obesity is actually it's had a negative effect on the quality of organs that we get. So, um, you know, especially uh, in liver transplantation, which is what I primarily do, um, the idea of using a, a fatty liver or a liver from someone who is type 2 diabetic, and when you are type 2 diabetic, you have a higher likelihood of having a fatty liver, that's made the organ supply even lower. And you couple that with the fact that I agree that, di that obesity will lead to end organ problem, especially liver fat failure, as well as the more popular kidney failure um, and, and, and diabetes. So it's a, it works both ways. It increases the need and decreases the availability of organs. Could you talk about um, disparities in um, ethnically and racially in terms of the need for donations, uh, uh, is, there, is there a difference between um, the need for donations amongst African Americans versus uh, Caucasians in the U.S.? What causes that there is? There is what causes that disparity? What can we do about it? There is a disparity, um, uh, principally because certain uh, diseases <laughs> tend to be more, more pre prevalent in cer certain ethnic populations. Um, you know, this year was the first year in, um, since we've been recording data that the number of deceased donors in this country actually declined. And it actually declined most severely in the African American population compared to, um, to other either minorities um, or um, the white population. So it's, again, it cuts both ways. We have more people who are in need and we have less people who are, who are donors, uh, specifically in the ethnic minorities. Can you answer, you, I guess I'm going to ask you a third question. Can you answer the, uh, you posed the question about is there, you know, you asked people and you told what the poll said about whether wealthy people can get organs versus not. What's the answer to that question in the United States? Um, the true answer is actually yes, they can. Because, and I have to give a caveat there, it's not because they're given any more favorable position to get the organ. But if you're wealthy, you actually have more, more access to care. Um, and you're, you're allowed in this country to put your name on more than one waiting list. Now, certain insurance companies only let you put your name on waiting lists. For instance, if you have uh, state aid, you can only put your name on a list from that state. But if you're independently wealthy, you could put your name on 60 lists, potentially. So there is actually a wealth advantage, but it's not because we take that into account when the person's uh, name comes up on a, on a waiting list. So does that still account for a disparity then in African Americans versus Caucasians? I, I think that's a very, very donations. good point. I think that actually may be part of the, part of the explanation. So thank you very much. Sure. Um, now we're going to move on to uh, Melody Williams. And uh, she also has a compelling story to share with us. Um. It was a year ago that I received a call uh, from my daughter's boyfriend saying Crystal was in the hospital. And so I immediately went to the hospital 
um, and she was in her room, and I said, what's going on? And she says, well, uh, Dr. Kaplan sent me over because I was complaining about chest pains. And so when I got to the hospital, they kind of swarmed on her because they thought it was her heart. But they couldn't figure out why her blood pressure was still high. So they ran a lot of tests, and then they decided, well, they're going to do a biopsy. And that was a few days later. And so then we didn't get the results. So the next day I was at work, and she calls me. And you could hear her. She had been crying. And she says, it's my kidneys. And I'm like, what do you mean it's your kidneys? And she says, it's my kidneys. They're gonna, they said, I need a kidney transplant. And I'm like, you're joking. And, you know, she says, no. And I said, well, I'll be there in a few minutes. And she says, well, I'm, I'm going to rest. And so I hung up the phone, and I just put my hands in my face. I just like, what in the world is going on? Um, and I thought about, well, my niece a couple of years ago had a kidney transplant, and my family has a history of high blood pressure and diabetes. And, you know, I was like, you know, what did I do wrong as a parent? And I was just like, I can't believe it. And so then she was in the hospital, and then they said she would be on medication, and she needed to get a kidney transplant as soon as possible. And I'm like, okay. So she comes home, and I remember we both went to the doctor, and Crystal would say, now, Mom, don't say nothing. I want you to, you know don't say anything. I'm like, okay, I won't say anything. So then the doctor comes in the room and he starts talking and he says, well, you know, it's good. She's young and, you know, she's going to get on the list and we have medication that we can give her because she was kind of adamant about not going right way on dialysis. So then I said, well, I can be a donor. And my daughter says, no, I don't want you to be a donor because I need somebody to take care of me. And I'm like, okay. So then what happened was is that Crystal did end up giving them my name, and I ended up going through the procedures, and, you know, I did all the tests. But come to find out, we are two different blood types, and I'm just like, oh, my God, because I've always heard you had to be compatible, and I'm like, Jesus Christ, you know, I was like, all right. We got to get through this. We got to get through this. And remarkably, we ended up doing the transplant. But it was, you know, I went through all the tests, but just the emotional part of just, you know, you know, that my daughter needed a kidney because I just couldn't do nothing. I did not want her to go to dialysis three times a week and just be trapped on this machine. And without her knowledge, I would ask friends, what blood type are you? Are you old? And, and, and you know, people were like, is she crazy enough? I was literally out there looking for a kidney for my daughter, you know, because I thought you had to be the same blood type. But the hardest part with this was seeing her going through this and not knowing that I was compatible. Because if you, you always hear on the TV shows, you got to be perfect match. You got to be a perfect match. You got to be a perfect match. And I wasn't. We were not. But Cedars pulled it off. And I am so grateful to Cedars. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing that that hospital could, you know, say. If they needed me to, you know, tell our complete story about this whole process, I would. But... You know, my daughter is sitting there in the audience, and she, you know, she's up and running. I mean, she's able to travel. And, you know, I am so happy that I was able, I was able to do it. I mean, I was, in spite of my family's history, I was able to give a kidney. And I always have my little dot on my driver's license. I never imagined that I would have ended up giving a kidney. I, you know, usually you, you give them when you, you know, you pass on, but I was able to do it now. And I can see the results of my daughter, you know, being here. So I'm just very thankful. Thank you, Melody.
Um, can you briefly tell us how you're different s after going through this experience? Well, I look at it as I've given something of myself. People can donate money. They can, you know, do charitable work. But I've literally given something of myself to somebody else. And I can see the end result. How's it changed your life? That I'm trying to spread the word. I'm trying to spread the word that there are so many people out here that need an organ. And people should really step up to the plate. If you know somebody that needs help, volunteer. You know, and like I said, it, it's changed my life in a way that I want to spread the word. And how did when you saw your daughter uh, in recovery? Well, you you gave the kidney too. So the first time you saw your daughter, she was sitting up, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like. Oh, my God, you know. But I literally, they rolled me past, and she was sitting up. And I was so happy. I was just so happy to see her healthy, you know. So that's a great detail, you know, that you'd want to, you know, I could just see, like, we would, if we were still riding on ER, we would definitely have that moment <laughs> where the donor is lying there and the person is sitting up. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. And we'll... Um, now hear from uh, Thomas Moan, who's the Executive Vice President of One Legacy, and then we'll take questions from you all. Thanks very much. Um, you know, first off, I want to let Jamie know that the word harvest and harvesting was officially retired by the Donation and Transplantation Community about three and a half years ago. Now, it still shows up now and then in the OR late at night, uttered usually by, okay, older transplant surgeons. We don't have any of those at this panel. <laughs> Um, and you'll also hear it routinely in television shows and the movies because it is such a visceral and visual word. And I think that's one of the things we struggle about in working in the field of donation and how it relates to the media is there is great drama in the whole notion of transplantation. And there is no doubt that the subject of death, while it is eerie and frightening, it's, therefore it is emotionally laden and a lot of opportunity to expand on that. And if I were a writer, I would run rampant with that because it's a lot of fun things to play with. But we know uh, very well that the results of some of that are some of the statistics that uh, Dr. Klein shared here. And uh, that, in fact, was borne out in a study done in Purdue University by Dr. Susan Morgan, who found that public attitudes were specifically related back to TV show and movie episodes of the, of the of, uh, uh, about donation in particular and transplantation, but particularly focusing on the donation side. The, one of our favorites and probably the most powerful one out there is uh, that uh, if I have a donor card, the uh, ambulance do uh, guys, the EMTs, won't try to save my life. If I show up in the ER, they'll stop taking care of me because they want my organs. And this is, as the, as, uh, the statistics Dr. Klein shared, uh, shared with you, this is compelling and meaningful to a lot of people. Um, and frankly, we, I presume most of us here from Southern California, um, we have an even greater challenge here because we have probably the largest population of people who have immigrated to this country from places where if they know about transplantation, we're lucky. If they've ever had experience dealing with donation, uh, we're shocked. And that's not to be, that's not to be uh, surprising, it, but it's a fact of life and what we have to deal with. So where do they learn about these things? Where do they learn about donation and transplantation? Well, we learn most of our information from television, radio, movies. And, th and that type of misinformation clouds the efforts to try to get the message to these people about the value and the good from donation. The, the good news here, and there is some good news, is uh, 10 years ago, only 50% of the people in this country who could donate at the time of death did so. This last year, it was 71%. That's a pretty dramatic improvement, and there's not many areas of social giving at that level of donation. Blood donation is only 7%. So it's not all a bad story, but there's, we also know there's 106,000 people waiting, and that number grows every year. So we have to continue to grow this. Melody's made a tremendous donation, and living donation is probably the biggest part of the solution here. But deceased donation remains a possibility. 
And, you know, some people like uh, Joe, Dr. Sachs here, has been uh, received an award from Donate Life Hollywood this last year at the film festival uh, for his great work on ER. Uh, and we applaud him for that because it was exceptional. And it sent the right message out. And you saw some nice examples of the humanity there. Uh, but there are still shows, uh, Mercy Itself and Desperate Housewives this year, who portrayed surgeons and people who work with me, or organ recovery, donate life uh, professionals, as vultures, <laughs> wandering around looking for organs. And, uh, but what we know at the front lines, when we're working with families who've just lost someone, families like Ken and his family, is at that time of death and the time of talking about the opportunity to donate. And it's that it is not about taking organs. It is not about uh, asking someone to, to give you their organs. It's about giving them the opportunity to take back a piece of life and control, an opportunity to make something good from, and fulfill a life that's cut short. Uh, and that is the message that is the compelling story, because that's transformational for those families. It takes them from being victims to taking hold of their life and finding opportunity again in lives that can be fulfilled into the future. And I can go back to, I'll end with my very first donor case I went on 10 years ago. I walked in and I was being, and the coordinator said, I'm going to introduce you to the donor mom. And all of a sudden around the corner comes this woman, and she looks at me and she wraps her arms around me and says, thank you. Thank you for helping my son live his life. I know he died, he was 18, but he's saved five other lives tonight, and he's lived his life. Thank you. She was not, she will mourn that death. She'll probably mourn that death to her dying day. But she saw her son have a fulfilled life. And that is uh, the most compelling story, because we watched right there the transformation from loss and grief to hope and future. Thank you. So, um, question. I think Dr. Montgomery said that between 19 and 20 people die per day on average, correct, um, for lack of an organ. Uh, and the Institute of Medicine fairly recently started to talk about paying donors. Uh, since you're in the thick of it, what, what's, what do you think about that? You know, very briefly, um, I know people want to ask questions. What do you think about that? What, what does that raise any problems? Yes. Um, yeah, this, this is actually, it's, it's actually sitting on the governor's desk here in California right now. We were asked to talk uh, with the governor's office about ways to increase donation in the state. He had a very compelling meeting with uh, Mr. Jobs, someone who was, uh, did not get bumped up the list, got his, his liver appropriately, but found his way and could afford to his private Gulfstream to get there to Memphis, Tennessee, where the list is very short. Um, and the governor said, well, and we, and we talked about, what about tax incentives? What about tax breaks for donors? Tax breaks for living donors, frankly, there's a probably pretty compelling argument. To be a living donor, you had to give up some time of your life and probably some, uh, time at work and some income and a lot of other expenses associated with that. There's probably some real value in that. It's not about making money. I'm not selling my organ. I'm sure you didn't do that for the money. No. Uh, but uh, the deceased donor family, well, they're not really losing any economic gain. They have a tremendous emotional loss. It's very, very, uh, it, it's, a, it's a tougher debate in the, uh, the ethics of this in the community because you're not about offsetting expenses. You're about rewarding somebody for the organ. And when you look at the places in the world where this is done, in the Philippines, in Pakistan, in India, in Iran where it's state-sanctioned, um, you see that you develop a donor class. That's actually now called a vendor class, people who vend, who sell their organs. And every study out there says that a year later they regret it and they're in worse physical shape than when they started. Uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the evidence is not very positive about paying people to donate. Um, there's probably a place for covering some of the costs, but it's not very positive on the social um, uh, ethics uh, standpoint. Thanks. So plenty to write about for, for <laughs> writers. Questions? We'll take a few questions. Yes? Of the different blood, oh, sorry. How did you solve the problem of the wrong blood type? I mean, what do you do to make that work? You would have to ask the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there are a number of strategies you can do to, um, to transplant across blood, blood types. Um, uh, some of them involve giving certain medications that help trick the, the immune system. Sometimes if it's actually across blood types, you have to remove the, the spleen. Um, but there are ways where you can um, 
as I said, trick the immune system to not have such a violent response, uh, even though the blood types are, are different. And then there's, of course, uh, swapping so that you can, uh, you can get the appropriate blood type. Yes. I've been in a number of emergency rooms. I do a lot of volunteer work, and even today I was with my uncle at USC's emergency room, and I never see anything about donations there. Are you not allowed to put the material where, say, people live or where people die? I can, I can comment on that. Um, in general, it is, we find when people walk into the hospital, they're a little scared, and it's really not where you want to first raise the topic. Hopefully they thought about it beforehand. <laughs> And for a while, the hospitals were asking people when they uh, registered, um, name, insurance company, who's your next of kin, do you want to donate your organs <laughs> in case you die on the table? <laughs> Not the right message for the hospital. So hospitals have backed away, and we in the organ recovery business support them. We'd rather have that conversation beforehand. On the other hand, to have that in your doctor's office would be great. There was nothing to do for hours of looking for reading material. <laughs> We'll, we'll see, maybe there's some, we'll set, by, we actually, to be honest, the place we're putting now is we're putting in a um, uh, place where you stand around with nothing to do for a long time is at the DMV, and we're putting in video PSAs. <laughs> Jamie, Jamie, how are you doing outreach with kids? With the kids? Yeah. Well, the thing, it, it's hard to get in, it's hard to get into the schools, obviously, that's a tough thing, and it, it uh, any, any of the OPOs that had to work with uh, the public school system. There was competing time. There was, there was limitations. It's very hard. Um, you know, I'm 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 a believer about the earlier comment, which is that it, um, love it or not, you know, it's it's all about the, it's all about television and, and media. Um, I think education. That's why you're dealing with a very, um, you know, a very powerful medium in terms of communicating knowledge to people because, you know, there's there's not a there's not a lot of, uh, I mean, with all of the distractions and involvements with, you know, if you really broke apart how kids spend their time these days, and I have two of them, um, you know, there, there, there isn't the sort of time to really stop and ask questions about what you're seeing, as, as one might hope for. So, and I don't think that's going to change, you know. So in my mind, it's about uh, just, you know, trying to get the, the accurate information. There's a great precedent for this, though. I, um, you know, what's the first thing that your kids say when you get in the car? Dad, put your seatbelt on, right? Kids know that when you get in the car, you put your seatbelt on. When you die, you donate your organs. So I think you're right on, uh, you know, in, in reaching out to uh, kids because their minds are not set yet. And they haven't been, you know, exposed to uh, the sort of mystical forces, you know, and, and the various reasons why people uh, don't donate their organs. Absolutely. Can, and, you, Jamie, you, there is a actually a, um, in, kids know that because they learn oftentimes in health class, and there's a bill in the state legislature this year to incorporate 30 minutes of organ donation education in health class. Great. Can you explain what, because like, I saw people give you a puzzled look when you said organ swapping. So can you sure. briefly explain that? Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, there are a couple of ways that people can be incompatible with a potential donor. If you take any two people in this room, there's a 35% chance that they'll be blood type incompatible. And about 30% of the people who are waiting on the list, either from pregnancies, blood transfusions, or previous transplants have been exposed to other people's tissue and have become sensitized against that tissue, just like you would with an allergy. And that sensitization can cause an immediate rejection of the organ. Um, so this is a large public health problem, um, incompatibilities. And as Dr. Klein said, you know, there are two ways to deal with that. One, you can trick the immune system into not recognizing the organ as being incompatible. And the other way is you can find someone else who has the opposite incompatibility and have your donor donate to their recipient and their donor donate to you. Um, and then everybody gets a compatible organ. And, uh, you know, that's been termed kidney swaps. And, 
there are more and more of those that are being done every year. Um, and uh, there actually now is um, a pilot study um, that we're uh, a part of to try to do the, in the initial steps towards creating a national database for doing this. And there are computer algorithms that have been developed. Actually, one of them was featured on the show Numbers um, that was developed at our institution. Um, and uh, it's sort of like a, a dating service. You know, it matches up compatible um, pairs. Um, so this is a way of, we've estimated that, uh, that we could do um, a, an additional uh, 3,000 transplants a year if you could get around these incompatibilities at, the, at a, a large scale, at a national level. So 3,000, and we're only doing 16,000. So that's a huge increase in the number of, uh, it said, and, and of those 16,000, only 6,000 are from live donors. So you would, you would be increasing by 50% the number of live donors. So this, this is a big thing. I wonder how you could use it, like, chat roulette for organ donation or the internet seriously <laughs> well there it th i mean that's you know the, the the public is always way ahead of us and that is happening um it's called matchingdonors.com and it's an online um, reservoir of stories moving stories of uh, people who need organs and and you can uh, get online and and decide that you want to give an organ to a particular person because their story touches you. That's a good story for an episode. Yes. <laughs> you. Well, yes. So I have a, a problem with, thank you, I have a problem with all of this in the sense that it seems that the part of me that's a writer, filmmaker, is always in a reactive position. The part of me that's a doctor, bioethicist, is always trying to think ahead. My question, and I think maybe Dr. Montgomery could answer this, or anyone, is is there an algorithm that you can think of with points that have to be covered that would make people understand transplant better over time. So when you react to different things, so we have start with children, we have get information out, dispel myths, and those kind of things. But if I wanted to do a series of points, uh, educational pieces or, or narrative pieces, is there an algorithm that's been established by people who know the business? Well, I think I would probably defer to somebody who's involved in uh, education, um, but it is a, it's an incredibly complex, difficult uh, topic to get your arms around. Um, and um, part of it is, as Dr. Klein mentioned, that there are these very powerful myths that are out there that um, distract people. Um, and there are also equally powerful human interest stories out there that are told all the time, too. And um, so there are a lot of kind of mixed messages that people get about transplantation. And indeed, it is an unusual, for a, for a physician, it's a very unusual field to be in. And uh, we were discussing this earlier, because you're at, on one hand, you're the shepherd of a scarce resource, and on the other hand, you're an advocate for your particular patients. And you have to balance those pressures every day. You know, has your patient become too ill to benefit from a transplant? Because if you take an organ and try to save that patient when it's futile, you take that organ away from someone else. And um, so it's a, uh, it, it's, a, it's a field that is very charged because there are these life and death decisions that are, are made. And it's dramatic. I mean, it is very dramatic. And so it is, I think, uh, enormously complex for the people who do it every day and to try to make it uh, you know, easier to understand for the public, I think, is a real challenge. It makes it 
interesting for writers because it's full of minefields and ethical dilemmas, and we've heard so many of the different parts of wealth, ethnicity, race, class, access, you know, which make, make it pretty complicated. But um, we should take, we'll take two more questions. Yes. <laughs> Can you speak to us a little bit about the doctor experience? Is it the emotional impact that, it, that you deal with every day? Well, I, th I think I just touched on one of the very interesting uh, tensions that exist in, in what we do, which I actually find very challenging and interesting. And, you know, you have to keep your ethical uh, compass, you know, lined up all the time because you're constantly being challenged. Um, you know, you're being called in the middle of the night um, with an offer, you know, for a patient on your list, an organ that most organs are, you know, not quite perfect in some way and you have to decide whether it's a, a good enough organ to use, you know, and you're tired and, you know, you, you have to have a tremendous amount of, uh, uh, of fortitude to keep doing that day in, day out, to make these, you know, decisions, to ignore some of your own um, needs in order to do the best you possibly can, not just for your patients but for humanity because these decisions that you make affect other people um, if you decide to take an organ or not to take an organ, you know, for your patient, it affects other people as well. I think that's what I'm speaking to is what, it, what do you do to, what do you do to keep yourself that available for those really big decisions? How do you recover day in and day out from this really heavy? I think that the, the way that I do is from my patients. Um, there are few things in medicine that are as dramatic as um, taking an organ from a, you know, a dead person or a, a live person and shifting it into another person and restoring their health and their life. I mean that, and, and to be involved in those dramas and to get um, the feedback from your patients um, about how this has affected their lives. I have a bulletin board in my office that has, you know, countless uh, Christmas cards and letters. You know, I just walked my uh, daughter down the aisle, which uh, I would have never happened, you know, if you hadn't done my transplant. Um, you know, I'm the coach for my son's, uh, um, you know, uh, baseball team and that wouldn't have ever happened. I mean, these really dramatic life, real life stories about how you've impacted someone's life. That's what keeps me going, for sure. Dr. Klein, do you want to add? Yeah, well, I, I would agree with what Dr. Montgomery said. I would add that, you know, it's an amazing gift that's probably unlike anything else that we do in medicine. And you develop relationships with your patients that are unlike the the one you might if you took someone's appendix out and saw them in six weeks and never saw them again. And I was interested to see that, that Joe's a scuba diver, so I'll tell you one quick story. The first person who I ever transplanted, he and I now go scuba diving every year. And so uh, the first time we were diving, it was on the, um, the Cayman Wall. So I'm at 100 feet, and I realized that five year, years ago, um, he put his life in my hands. Now my life is in his hands. <laughs> so it's a very, uh, it makes you really think about, you know, about life when you have those experiences. With that, I'm going to uh, end with uh, two minutes from Sandra. Thank you all for what has been a wonderful and inspiring e event. And for the writers out there, please know that you can call on Hollywood Health and Society for any time you're working on a health storyline, on uh, organ transplantation or any other health topic. And I'd like to extend a warm thank you to all of tonight's speakers. This has been an extraordinary evening. And finally, I want to call your attention to the pink sheet in the back of your packets. It's an evaluation form. Your feedback is very important to us. 
There's a box by the front door, and we have lots of extra pens and extra evaluations by the reception table if you need them. So please take the time to fill it out, um, and it will help us plan future events to benefit our community of writers. Thank you all, and thank you, panelists. <laughs>